Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine Podcast Radio. You're about to listen to an episode of Tech Done Different Podcast with Ted Harrington. Do you follow the pack or challenge the status quo? Join Ted as he explores how to succeed by going against conventional wisdom. You'll hear leaders in technology and security tell stories about how they achieve their success by doing things differently. Knowledge is power. Now, more than ever. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Tech Done Different. I'm your host, Ted Harrington, and I got my infamous co-host, Ben Schmerler, with me. Ben, what's going on, man? Hey, Ted. I'm infamous now? Yeah, I don't know what word I was going for, but we're, we're <laughs> running with infamous. So. <laughs> All right, fine. I'll take it. Famous for a bad reason. Okay, good. And we have our special guest, someone that I've had the pleasure to work with for many, many years, Ian Hamilton, the CTO of Signiant. Ian, I'm really excited to have you on the show here. Thanks for having me. So I'm excited to have this conversation because what you guys have been able to do is something that I think a lot of our audience is really interested in, and that's take an idea and really, truly scale it. And you and I were chatting about this the other day. We were at a uh, conference together and we're just kind of chatting about where you are now versus sort of what's happened over the last many, many years. And as soon as you started talking about it, I was like, wow, we should, we should talk about this. So maybe you could give me the, obviously there's a lot to this story and I know you've been at it for I think 17 years or some, some very, very long period of time, but maybe you could give us in the, the brief nutshell, where did you, where did you guys start and how are we here? Yeah, uh, it, it has been a very long period of time and it's actually been longer than 17 years, which is really strange for a venture back company, but the company has been multiple companies as you tend to be, if you've been around that long through a few pivots along the way. But most recently we've been focused on the media and entertainment market and in that market initially on helping our customers move from shipping physical media around the world to get their product places to actually doing it electronically. And you know that was the first big pivot. Beyond that, there was a major pivot to SaaS at one point. And that was both a technical and a cultural change that we had to get through. And as you said, it's nice to be on the other side you know, at this point with 50 million in, in bookings and almost all SaaS ARR. So it, it's a great position to be growing from being cash flow positive and having a nice stable SaaS revenue stream to continue to build our business on. That's really interesting. And, you know, you talked about these pivot points. So one was going from like this physical to digital. Now you're talking just the digital idea to, to software as a service based. In the, in the little pre-call we had, you talked about sort of the timing of this and converting stuff. Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Because I think our audience might find it a little bit interesting about moving from something that was well-known and established to something that was kind of new and at new as particularly at the time. Yeah. And, and to be clear, our, our venture capitalists always wanted us to get to a recurring revenue model that even with the initial investments, when we entered the media space and, you know, we were saying, we don't think our customer base is going to accept that. That's not what they're looking for. And even when we started our SaaS transition, it was, it was, it was, we got a lot of funny looks from our customers saying, you're saying you want to operate this software for me and I don't, you know, buy computers and stuff to run it on. Like, how does that work? That, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, clearly in 2023, it was obviously the right thing to do. And it's, it's an obvious way that the software industry is gone. But back then there were some yeah sideways looks at, at what we wanted to do and why we were trying to do it. We were definitely pioneers in the media space in terms of delivering our software products as SaaS. That moment was it's such a brave decision that you guys went through. And I, I actually remember you making parts of that transition. You had these like really well-established products and you're like, we're going to move away from these products now. We're going to deploy these new products. And so for someone who's listening right now, who's themselves has something that's working, they've established product market fit, they have recurring revenue already, but they're evaluating maybe a disruptive change. 
how would you recommend they think about that evaluating that decision like what did you go through at that time when you knew you were going to face resistance you knew that it was going to be difficult you knew you might lose customers in the process but you knew or you assumed that eventually it would pay off and it turns out that it did but can you put us in the mindset of how you thought in that very maybe scary moment yeah well it i mean it wasn't a cold turkey cut. It wasn't like, hey, you can't buy our software anymore as a perpetual license with recurring with maintenance payments. It was we need to address a portion of the market that can't provision their own servers in their own data center with their own software. And that was actually the main thing that that started to drive our thinking about SaaS, obviously the recurring revenue model that that our our financial backers wanted to get to weighed on our mind, but it was really about making our software much more accessible to a much broader market and and increasing our addressable market opportunity. And and most of the factors that we considered were were in that realm. When we're talking about SaaS, you know, I, it's funny you say everyone's using software that you know we're talking on on Zoom right now, and we were probably use. I imagine you're probably using. SaaS-based email and, and file services like everybody else now. You know, over the history of the company, I'm sure there were other opportunities to make disruptive changes. And I'm sure other people maybe even proposed doing other changes. And now the SaaS thing is quite obviously the right choice. I mean, it's it's the standard of the, of the industry. But how do you sort of weigh the risks when someone comes to you or you maybe you have an idea and you say, well, we want to make this change and it's radical. How do you sort of weigh the risks of sticking with something that's really well known? and feels comfortable versus something that you maybe you have a compelling feeling that has to change. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And that's a really good question. And, and it is a really hard question. When do you pivot? When do you keep going with incremental innovation versus fundamental innovation? And, you know, the answer is that quite often it's, it's the direction is forced on you by others saying, your growth rate isn't high enough. <laughs> you need to do something different. Get your growth rate up. And it's, I, I don't think there's one answer to that question. I mean, there's a confluence of factors that come together to, to define whether a pivot is necessary or whether you just keep going on the course that you're on. I wish I had a better answer than that, but you know, every, every situation is unique. And it, it may not be that weird to, to not know. I mean, in some ways we're all kind of just working with the best information we have, you know? So and maybe that's reassuring to people that, that even when you do it right, you're not really, <laughs> you never quite know. <laughs> I think a key thing is having a great team of people that you're working with that you can talk about these things and, and discuss, you know, what is the right approach. And like I said, it wasn't cold turkey. We didn't say one day, tomorrow we're a SaaS business. We said we should introduce a SaaS product and we should measure the success of that SaaS product. And once that SaaS product was successful and it was clear that this would create a much more valuable company, it was, okay, we got to commit 100% to this SaaS direction. So that that took a period of a few years to make the decision once we made the decision to introduce a SaaS product in the first place. Once you did make that decision, I imagine that you ran into resistance from probably every front. Uh, you probably had resistance internally. There was probably cultural resistance to it. You probably had influential leaders who were opposed to the change. I'm, I'm surmising. I don't know if any of these things are true. But can you talk about one of the bigger pieces of resistance you ran into and how you dealt with that? Because change is hard. Change is scary. I mean, even small changes people resist. So how do you do that kind of change? Surprisingly, you know, I, and maybe not surprisingly being a CTO, I thought technical resistance would be a big issue and internal technical resistance, but our engineering team was, was all over it. They were like, yeah, we want to build this multi-tenant cloud native SaaS service. And, and we want to learn about all of these new things. Surprisingly, I think it was, it was more on the business side that there was resistance of our salespeople and our marketing people. And quite frankly, that whole side of our business, not, not necessarily our sales leaders and marketing leaders, but a lot of the people in that area of our business turned over as we, as we made this transition, they were just, it was either they didn't want to be part of it, or it was clear that they weren't going to make it through. And, you know, if you had to ask me before we did this, 
what would happen that would not have been what i predicted but that is the area of the biggest the biggest change i would say in our in our company as we went through the transition it's a real challenge i mean another sort of question i had was when you know it's sort of important in business in general to sort of step away and you know day to day there's all these things on our plate there's you know some fire that we have to put out how do you sort of step back and say i'm going to make time to think about the long term and what the company needs to look like or what my product needs to look like 6 months or a year from now and what do you have any insight or any tips that you you'd like to share yeah i i had a partner in a previous company who used to call it the functional bureaucracy of the company and and not getting caught up in the functional bureaucracy of the company and in in every company that i've been a part of we we always had to consciously make time for those big picture planning. So offsites, like even when we were a company of three people, we tell our girlfriends and wives, oh, we're, we're going to some city for three days. And they're like, oh yeah, sure you are. This is business. <laughs> and, and, but literally it was like, we had to, we had to get out of the space that we were in, get into another space, start thinking in another way, working through a structured agenda and, and, you know, even today with, with Signia, we have executive offsites every, every quarter and we, go somewhere and we sit in a room as the executive team and we talk through important issues and and think about things other than the functional bureaucracy of our day-to-day job. That's interesting. I'm hearing you talk about the distinction between working in the business, which would sort of be the functional bureaucracy versus working on the business, which would be the kinds of things you're talking about in the, in the retreats. So th- that's a fascinating idea of actually physically changing your environment as a way to change the way that you think. Why has that worked for you? Is it because you're removing yourself from the daily distractions of your normal job and the normal distractions of your daily life and stuff like that? Or is there some other power in this idea of going a different place? I I, I think human beings are creatures of habit and (laughs) you, you know, you will continue to do the same things unless acted on by an external force. So that just physically changing your environment and, and it just makes us think differently and, and interrupts our, our habits as creatures of habit. It's funny you mentioned external forces. That's kind of where I was going next. Some of the big areas of change that you've had have taken place, not just at any particular time, I think you mentioned one time that you were making a big change. And this was during the financial crisis in 2008. And I think there's an instinct that a lot of people have where something really big is happening, you know, the, you know, the banks are having or shutting down or something like that. And the instinct is, is to pull back. Well, we need to, we need to put things on pause, we need to stop, we need to, to rally the troops and, and, and cower a little bit and make sure things are safe. But I think for you, you actually took some opportunities to change and that these disruptive periods in our country's history were opportunities for you to change the business. I mean, I guess my question is sort of how, what's that like? And sort of how do you look past these big external forces that can be scary, but maybe don't have anything to do with the core goal of the business? Yeah. I I mean, change, change is always opportunity, right? (laughs) Opportunity to fail and opportunity to succeed. But I mean, we may have, I may have miscommunicated slightly around the 2008 financial crisis because our perpetually licensed software business was actually going through quite a growth phase before we hit 2008 and 2008 stalled things out. And there was an imperative. We actually did, as you said, people shouldn't do. We turtled and retrenched and said, how are we going to make it through this, through this period? and and batten down the hatches so it was actually coming out the other side where we made this where we made this transition so as soon as we saw that things were were moving in the right direction there was another external force which was our board decided to replace the ceo of our company which brought in fresh thinking and um a lot of people who are great leaders have, have told me the secret to being a great leader is to talk to everybody about what they want to do and then get out in front and say, let's do it. So the the new leader that we brought in, our current CEO, Margaret Craig, you know, is a brilliant person, but a lot of what she brought to the table was just, yes, this thinking about SaaS is the right way to go and help 
to convince everybody that their thoughts, which weren't yet convictions on it, were correct and to become convictions. So I don't know if I answered your question, but but definitely for us, it was, and it has been on the other end of big disruptive events, coming out the other end is where we've made our transitions and fortunately successful transitions. That was a pretty cool insight that you just revealed about really leadership through change. The The idea that I heard you describe listening is such an important aspect. So it sounds like this new CEO comes in. That's probably a pretty contentious situation for anyone, any leader to come into and then has to not only gather support for herself as a leader, but really understand what it is that everyone's trying to do. And then once the vision becomes clear to rally people around it, and it seems like listening is the heart of that. Is that a correct read on kind of what you guys have gone through? Well, I mean, I think if there's one thing I've learned in my career, it's listening is the heart of a lot of things. You know, the old adage, we have two ears and one mouth, we should use them that way is, uh, is true. So I think, yes, listening and sharing ideas and, and making sure you're actually understanding what other people are telling you and not just using it as confirmation bias for your own ideas is, is critical to success in, in everything in life. What other tips do you have that you can maybe share about sort of staying a leader in your space? I mean, I think a lot of software companies that are in your shoes would be envious of the staying power and the ability to adapt in, in the technology space. I just feel like, uh, I just feel like you have a font of knowledge that you could offer in, in that regard, staying relevant. Observing what's going on around you and changing with it to make sure that you're staying relevant. That sounds that sounds trite and simple, but it, it does come back to the question you asked earlier about when do you pivot, right? Like when is there when is there an abundance of information that indicates that you should that you should change the course you're on in a major way? And you know, I'm as a software person, agile software methodologies, I think can be applied to almost everything in life and reducing time to feedback is is something that can be used to optimize any process so how can we quickly gather data on whether this change we've made is having the impact that we wanted it to have and how can we continuously improve so continuous improvement is another key tenant of agile software development we take time at the end of every iteration to retrospect and think about what we did well, what we didn't do so well and experiments that we can try to improve and then how we're going to measure that those experiments were actually successful. I think that that pattern can be applied to everything, whether they're, you know, that kind of implies small changes, but it can actually be applied to larger changes and pivots as well on a longer time frame and a broader scale. That's really interesting. The idea of thinking that these principles can apply both large and small. So let's, let's explore a little bit further on this path. What would be another principle that helps navigate that type of change? You know, I, I, uh, I think that it's all variations of the exact same theme. It's all, it's all, how do I reduce time to feedback? How do I measure the impact of what I'm doing? and make sure that the outcome that I've expected to improve has improved in the way that I expected it to. I mean, you can get very specific in examples of, you know, doing things like that, but it all fits into that, that pattern. And, and, you know, when you read things about the lean startup and you know, the concept of reducing time to feedback is, is, critical in in every one of these these how do you optimize a business outcome as as well as how do you, how do you optimize a technical outcome in a in a software development cycle so i don't know that i have any brilliant wisdom in that area other than other than that reducing time to feedback and and making sure that you know how you're going to measure success in in that feedback is a pattern that can be applied everywhere Another quick thing I wanted to hit on before we wrap up, you you mentioned to us before that you wanted to work in a company where you made a difference. Do you think like having that kind of attitude where 
you're sort of about, you know, in, creating products and, and tools that actually meet the, the client's needs that do you think that that helps you be willing to make change and willing to disrupt when you're sort of designing with a purpose? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think when, when I look at key things that make people successful, and we talked about techniques like reducing time to feedback, but just having that drive to help and to, you know, make other people better than they would be without whatever you're doing is, is just, is, is critical to everything. And, and that's what helps with top talent. And if you can identify that, that along with the desire to communicate. So going back to the listening thing that we talked about earlier, the desire to understand others as much as, as, as being heard by others is, is, is critical, but there has to be a deep down desire to improve things and make a difference for other people. Well, Ian, you've been awesome. There's been so much wisdom that you've shared. As we wrap up, is there any last insight you want to leave our audience with? Anything that Ben or I failed to ask you about that we should have? Well, that's a, that's a pretty wide open floor to, to start to start speaking, but this has been great. I really appreciate the opportunity, appreciate the questions, and hopefully everybody on the other end of this listening agrees that it's been interesting and useful. Hopefully. I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will. Well, Ian, thanks for stopping by. Great. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Ian. So, Ben, what do we think? Ian Ian has he is the real deal, right? He has led an organization through many twists and turns to arrive at a point that I think many people listening to our show also want to do if they haven't done it already. What's your takeaway after hearing all this stuff from Ian? Software and technology is really like a still a relatively young space if you want to think of it that way. I mean, when you think about the success Ian and his company has had, it's almost like an eternity. I mean, it seems like ages ago. It speaks to a really a willingness to change and not get stuck on something. I've been in this space for a while. I mean, so have you. Think about all the people you met, and especially people who have a technology background, who or, you know people who have the the engineering chops, who get very caught up in their way of doing things, and who get very caught up in doing things because this is the way I learned how to do it, or this is the way that is quote unquote best. And you know, I think Ian throws out the idea that just because something is working now doesn't mean you should just rest on your laurels and be comfortable about it. If you're if you're a little too comfortable, maybe you're ripe for being, you know, pushed out of your market or swallowed up or just getting stale. Yeah, that's a good way of saying that. I know we've experienced it, right? Like our business for the longest time, for the since the inception has been hack ethical hacking, right? And then when a few years ago we're like, well, what if we started this other company within the company to do to help with vendor risk management and like simplify some of that. And it, it's close, but it's different. And that was a, and still continues to be kind of a weird transition to go through because it is different and what we're doing is succeeding. And so why would we allocate effort and resources to start something new? And I think a lot of what Ian said is why, because it's these, this is how you grow a company is you think about your problems in new ways. You think about your customers' problems in new ways. And that's where we're at, right? First of all, it's more interesting to change things up. It's more dynamic. It makes you sharper and better at what you do. It makes you question your expectations. You know, the things that you assumed were good. You know, we all need to be checked on on that, you know, in terms of just, you know, the things that have gotten us to this point are probably not going to be the things that get us to the next point. I think we all could do, I mean, I think everybody could do a little bit better with it. It's it's all about being willing to, you know, put your, dip your toes into something different and seeing how the water feels. And then r rather than being afraid of it and just not willing to, to go and take that plunge. We're never far away from a metaphor. So uh, we're talking about I didn't, cold I didn't even mean to. It just, it just comes up. I know. It just falls I know. out of well, my mouth. I think that's why you and I get along because we talk to each other in metaphors. Like, <laughs> yes. I wonder if someone listening to us talk to each other would be like, what are those guys even saying? They're just talking in sports metaphors right yeah, now. Yeah, we can have our own version of the SATs that are just <laughs> weird tech metaphors. <laughs> I love that. It's like yeah. disruption is to water polo as yeah. <laughs> that would be it. We had to fit Tom Brady in there somewhere. I love it. I thought that was that was a really cool chat. And I've I've known Ian basically the whole time we've been doing ISE. And so I've known him for a while. And it's just so fascinating to watch 
like what they're doing and see the way that like they're following their business plan and it, adapting as needed. But there's so much, even though I've known him for so long, there's so much about the story that I don't know. And it's fat. I mean, that's selfishly, that's what's awesome about having a show like this. You can get people that you want to hear their story and you want to learn about because you just, you're curious, put them on the show. Right? Definitely. I, I guess I would say to the audience is if you're maybe, if you've been around business for a while, think about like the people that you've done business with and think of, you know, I think about when I started off in the mid 2000s, the people in the medical record space who didn't want to digitize, they still wanted to do things by paper. And that was the way they did it. And they didn't want to invest the costs and things like that. And a lot of these businesses are just gone. Like they don't exist anymore versus these ones that were very much willing to go out there and recognize that this just because they were comfortable doing something that they had to change. I mean, I bet you could look at any industry that you're in and think about your past and say, okay, you know, those guys never changed. And I really like doing work with them. And now they're not around anymore. And the reason is just because they were stale. They just didn't want, they just wanted to stay exactly as they were. And I can't think of too many industries or, or even avenues of life, hobbies, you know, personal crafts, whatever it is, where you could do that sort of thing, especially now in 2023. It is interesting. The idea of stale. I got an email yesterday from a friend of mine whose email address was from Hotmail. And I was like, they still make these things. I mean, I don't know. Did Hotmail... I don't, I guess I need to understand how well, hot it's hot. Calls. I mean, it says hot in the title, so you know, it's good. You know, it's yeah. good. <laughs> but I mean, they were an early leader and certainly something like Gmail is better than Hotmail. Gmail today is better than Hotmail today or at any point than Hotmail was. But like, is that because Hotmail was stagnant or what? I, I don't actually know the Hotmail story, but I know that they are no longer relevant. Somebody could be listening to this and you're talking about Gmail or saying, Gmail, why are you using that? Everybody just yeah. talks on Signal or something like that. Or, you know, and I'm not saying that that's the right attitude necessarily, but it's more like we should be willing to open ourselves up to new ways of doing things. I mean, now, of course, the hot thing is chat GPT. Everyone wants to talk about how they're using chat GPT to, to solve their business problems. Now, I don't know what the future of AI and chat GPT is. And I don't think anybody really knows what the future is, but I think it's pretty foolish to ignore it or to pretend and like, oh, I don't want to mess with that kind of thing. You know, if you're touching the space, you should at least dabble in it. You should at least see what this thing's all about and understand how it might impact the way you work or the, your industry. Yeah, it sort of came out of nowhere too. Yeah. Well, maybe that's a good note for us to end on. We give people some homework. Go look up Ch Chat GPT. Yeah, go look up Chat GPT and make goofy stories on it, like I do. Yeah, and give us, give me, give me a metaphor. Let's like, I'm gonna go have Chat GPT write me some metaphors that we can use in the next show. Maybe they won't be as good as my metaphors. I can tell you that. <laughs> Give me a less good metaphor than what Ben would do. All right, cool. <laughs> awesome, Ben. Well, this has been fun. Thanks for another good chat. I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, totally. Thanks, Ted. For everyone listening, you can learn more about the show at tedharrington.com backslash podcast, and we'll catch you next time. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Tech Done Different Podcast with Ted Harrington. If you learned something new and this conversation made you think, then share ITSPmagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.